Good evening y bienvenidos a Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices. I'm Alex Hernandez of Noticias Univision Chicago, which airs every weekday morning at 5 and 6. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. Little Village residents are sounding the alarm after two women are found dead and a teenage girl is missing. The toll of COVID-19 on Latino communities, three years after it was declared a pandemic. Towering alebrijes are on the move from a local park to a suburban mall. Find out where you can see them. I'm just so excited for this next chapter. I can put all my talents to good use. And it's a career-defining moment for hundreds of medical students. We catch up with two dreamers on match day. All that coming up. But our first story tonight, a community on high alert. We explain why right after this. Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices is made possible in part by the support of these donors. The Little Village community is on high alert as two young women have been found dead there in recent weeks. In February, 20-year-old Reina Cristina y Calcet was found shot to death in an alley. You see her here. In March, the body of 21-year-old Rosa Chacon, who had been missing since January, was also found in a neighborhood alley. And now, another reported disappearance. 15-year-old Asreya Lomeli, who was last seen walking in Little Village. At a news conference this week, Rosa Chacon's sister expressed frustration with the police. I just want to know, like, who did this to her? Why did they leave her the way they left her? For the police to have told me and my family that she was not in any danger, she was not a priority. Our family and every other girl's family that's been out there, we need to have closure and justice. Who's coming in and taking these little girls? Something needs to be done. Joining us now with more is uh, Baltasar Enriquez, president of the Little Village Community Council and community uh, resident Dolores Castañeda. I want to welcome both for joining us today. But uh, uh, we also uh, reached out to the Chicago Police Department, but didn't hear back from them. Thank you for being here again. Uh, our thanks uh, to both of you. But I want to start with you, uh, Baltasar. The statement we just uh, heard, actually, from Rosa Chacon's sister was at a news conference that actually your organization called. Why did you feel the need to hold a news conference? Uh, so thank you, Alex, for having us uh, and for telling our story. When we found out that um, Reina Cristina Carl was killed in our neighborhood, um, <clears throat> Dolores, I also contacted Dolores, uh, and we began organizing a march and a protest because uh, Reina didn't have no family here. So when we um, did this, we did this because you imagine sending your daughter or your loved one to the United States after that American dream, and it turned into a nightmare. She fled her country from, from violence, and she came and found it here in Chicago. So it's very concerning when the authorities, the homicide department, the police department, doesn't reach out to the community, doesn't reach out to organizations like mine or like Dolores and say, hey, the community is fine. There's no alert. And, you know, in our press conference, we said if this would have happened in the Gold Coast or Lakeview, they would have called out an alert to the community. They would have alerted the community. But it had to take a protest. It had to take our organization and our community to come together and demand justice in order for us to get some type of justice and also attention from the authorities, attention from the police to let us know what's going on. Um, at that time, when we were burying Reina, I, I then contacted Rosa Chacon's father and he was there and we started talking about Rosa Chacon. Uh -huh. And I received a call from, from the police department to stop exaggerating, that I shouldn't be exaggerating. So to me, one death is enough to exaggerate. And because um, there should be no woman dead here in my community, especially the way that Reina was killed. Um, so we, um, three I'm weeks sure later, Dolores, we received. 
uh, I'm sorry, but I'm sure Dolores probably feels the same way. What are you hearing from uh, community residents about the situation, Dolores? Are people afraid, um, especially women? The, the community residents, they not feel safe. They they very a tremendous impact for the killing about Reina and Rosa and the other two girls missing. And they say they want a justice. They want to cl clarification for the police and the detectives really what happened in Little Village because right now we don't know exactly what happened. And when the moms walking in the street or when the girls going to the school or to board or to enjoy with our friends, they really concern about that safe for them. And I noticed in Little Village, like a seven o'clock is nobody in the street. Like uh, everybody's in the house, everybody hiding because they're really afraid about what is the situation right now. The police, the aldermen, the mayor, nobody explained to us really the roots mm -hmm. about this problem in the community. And uh, we want to know exactly right. what is the situation right now. A lot of questions still need a lot of questions still need answers. Uh, Baltazar, you're in touch actually actually with the families of uh, the two women that were killed. Uh, what are they saying? Uh, the family in Guatemala, um, you know, they don't speak Spanish. We need interpreters for them. And they really don't know the process. Uh, but we're going to continue advocating and, and, and getting justice for her parents, for Reina. And for Rosa Chacon, yesterday was her funeral. It was very devastating to see the family uh, go through what they went through, closed casket funeral. So, you know, that really broke my heart to see that um, they don't give them answers. They give them nothing but, well, we think this is what happened. So, you know, we want real concrete answers and we, we really want to find out what happened so like that the community could be alert and could be um, aware of what happened to these two young ladies in our community. Definitely. Baltazar, are there any updates on the case, on the status of the missing teenager, Arreya Lomeli? Um, you know, when we talked to uh, the police department, they told us that since the young girl was reported in, in Monet, Illinois, that there was their case, that they didn't have jurisdiction, and that they were not investigating it. So then we gathered the community, we told them what they were, we were told, and we put pressure, pressure, and now the U.S. Marshals are involved. And we're trying to see if the FBI could get involved, too. Yeah. Dolores, as a resident, what do you want to see from uh, the police and the city leadership? I want, like, uh, more clarification about these cases. I want they put alarm in the community because it's like a nothing happened, you know. We need, they need to know the whole community exactly what happened and how to be safe because the police not they serious about this situation, they thinking is like a, like a, for example, uh, Mr. Jose, um, uh, the father de Rosa, he say the police told him, oh, probably she say, I uh, enjoy with a fam with a friends and have a good time and you concern about her. You know, they really not be empathy with the community, with uh, what really happened to us here in the community. We want justice and, and clarification and see that result about these problems. So you think there's there's uh, there's needs to be better communication with the police and the community? Yes. Exactly. Uh, well, thank you both for joining us today. I want to thank you, Baltasar Enriquez and Dolores Castañeda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Up next, three years since COVID-19 shoves down uh, took place across the state. A look back at lessons learned. <laughs> This month marks three years since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. Since then, 
More than 2,300 Latino Chicagoans have died from the disease, according to data from the Chicago Department of Public Health. As the U.S. plans to end the public health emergency for COVID in May, we look at efforts to make sure Latino communities aren't being left behind in public health and beyond. Joining us now with more are Linda Tortolero, President and CEO of Mujeres Latinas en Acción, Dr. Alfreda Mena, Alfredo Mena Lora, an infectious disease physician, assistant professor of medicine at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and medical director of infection control at St. Anthony Hospital. Alejandra Ibáñez, executive director of Illinois Unidos, and Dr. Geraldine Luna, medical director of the Chicago Department of Public Health. Thank you all for joining us today, especially on the weekend. Thank you for being here. But I want to start with you, Dr. Mena Lora. I'm sure, ladies, you won't mind. We make this <laughs> exception today, right? <laughs> Dr. Menelora, what are you seeing and uh, hearing from Latino communities uh, in particular about the impact of COVID early on? I think this was a very traumatic experience for all of us. And early on, the, the fear of COVID-19 was present throughout our communities and particularly in Latino communities where uh, the, the impact was disproportionate and many in our Latino communities were essential workers and therefore had to work even during the lockdowns, which were... Uh, very scary times for sure. Yeah. Dr. Luna, how about you? It's, it's been an, uh, a tremendous impact. We have lost, hey, we have had 212,658 cases alone, Latino, 30% of all 763,000. And we have had 2,639 deaths within all dead, which is 30% of the population. These are been horrible times for Latinx community, especially for all the above mentioned. Essential workers, less access to health care, um, the way that we live, which is normally our protective factor, but exposes us, multi-generational individuals living in the same household. So, and over-representation of chronic diseases, Alex. Extremely high numbers, definitely that. You know, obviously, we don't like to hear, but that's that. Those are the facts. Um, Alejandra, Illinois Unidos is a coalition of officials, health professionals, uh, community-based organizations that formed in response to the pandemic. Um, what are some of the most pressing needs you saw in Latino communities, and how did the coalition work to address uh, to address these issues? Sure. Thanks, Alex. Um, I would say, you know, the what we really realized that we needed and what was missing was language access, cultural competency. At the height of the pandemic, our community was not getting COVID-19 information. You know, we weren't getting information in the right language. And, and I'm not just speaking about Spanish. We have a very large indigenous community as well. Um, things were not being translated. Things were not being shared in a culturally competent way. It really opened the door for mis and disinformation on COVID to make its way through, which then became another barrier when the vaccines became available. Folks were scared. Right. I can't. I mean, for Spanish speakers, it's hard enough. I can't imagine for indigenous, it's That's even right. harder to find translation, definitely. Uh, Linda, your organization uh, has programs that focus on addressing domestic uh, violence and sexual uh, violence as well. H how did you see the pandemic impact the people you were serving? So uh, for many survivors uh, of domestic violence, we saw an increase in terms of the number of cases. In fact, worldwide, uh, experts called the pandemic for domestic violence the double pandemic. Um, and so the cases were more numerous, the cases were more intensive in terms of the experiences that these survivors were facing, um, and the aggravation of having economic stress because essential workers make up such a large population, and the infection rates because of the multi-generational households that Dr. Luna referred to really drastically impacted kind of the well-being of our survivors that we were seeing. Dr. Menalora, um, what are you seeing with the lack of uh, access to uh, quality, trustworthy information during the pandemic? That was a major uh, role, a major important thing that we all had to, uh, you know, a barrier that we had to overcome. And as, as mentioned, it does open the door for misinformation and disinformation. So it's very important for all of us in the medical community, in public health, and as a society to try to deliver culturally competent, culturally sensitive information. And I think uh, local media, particularly Spanish-speaking channels, really did a great job in trying to deliver important information uh, when it was most needed. Alejandra, uh, your organization was recently in Springfield advocating actually for workplace uh, health and safety legislation. How did the pandemic shed a light on the importance of workplace health uh, and safety? I think it made it very clear 
uh, for those who work in that sector, they have known, and for many of us who have lived experience with parents or elders who lived in manufacturing and meatpacking, our communities are overrepresented in those sectors. Um, but the epidemic just made it, the pandemic made it very clear to us that that became the most dangerous places to work, whether it was in manufacturing or if it was in hospitality. A lot of our uh, family members also work in care um, and they couldn't pivot and work from home. They had to work in person. They couldn't physically distance. It really became an unsafe place. And so those are some of our lessons learned. And right now we're hoping that legislation that would uh, provide opportunities for workers to identify those hazardous and unsafe working conditions, have an opportunity to lift those up so that we don't have to learn these lessons because we have paid with our lives. Definitely. Dr. Luna, what would you say was the toughest part for the city to uh, help in the process of uh, getting people uh, healthy and, and the help they needed, uh, people that were uh, getting sick from COVID and seeing so many people in the hospitals? I think the, for us and the most starking uh, reality is mistrust with the vaccines. Still today, Alex, 15% of Latino population has taken the bivalent vaccine, which we know holds all the information of the current COVID variant that it's around. So it's just stretching a hand, reaching out, giving the language, appropriate language. Still, we have the trust piece and the misinformation that they're getting from different areas. And we want to revamp our public health system, our health care system overall, so that people see in us friends and, and you know, the extension of the health that they need and bring down those barriers because there are significant barriers. There's still a lot of work to do, Alex. Is the city better prepared? Let's, uh, I mean, uh, no we, one wants another better, pandemic, obviously, yes, right? Yes, we, we better be better, better, uh, very prepared, and, and we're investing in those places that we need, especially as you were talking about, mental health now in the recovery mm -hmm. to bring that justice back to our communities. Definitely. Going back with you, Linda, um, could you talk about what Promotores de Salud uh, actually looked like during the pandemic and the role it played? Promotores de Salud were essential. Community health workers were also a vital, critical piece to this. Um, we have used this model for many years and so many, so many other partner organizations have. They have the trust of community members. They know the communities best. They live in those communities. They know where there are areas where they can make, make a great impact and share information. Um, because they're part of the community, they know some of the doubts and fears and concerns that may come from their family about taking the COVID vaccine or finding health access. Uh, that to us is important. But one thing that we've learned from this is that we have to make sure that we have community-driven approaches. So when they share with us, I have medical debt, how can I possibly keep going to a doctor and seeking services? Um, the fact that they have lack of health insurance, all of that needs to be going back to all of us to figure out how we can have right. solution, solutions to the, that, cons those very important concerns. Yeah, and knowing the importance of knowing that the resources are out there as well, that was definitely important. Dr. Uh, Menalura, the Biden administration plans, um, well, to let the COVID public uh, health emergency expire in May. So we're talking less than two months, actually. Uh, what are the major lessons learned and what are we um, better prepared from a public health standpoint to address uh, inequities going forward? Well, this won't be our last pandemic. And I think the lessons learned in this pandemic will certainly help us in future pandemics. Uh, I think one of the big positive things uh, that uh, the scientific and medical community was able to do was to uh, leverage our resources and do high quality clinical studies that brought us vaccines and treatments. And I think from an equity standpoint, including populations uh, and uh, also delivering these vaccines through promotoras and other community mm -hmm. uh, interventions is key. We have less than a minute and uh, Alejandra, you have the privilege of the last question. Um, can officials and organizations continue to protect uh, and address the Latinos, the needs of Latinos uh, residents? How can officials do it? Yeah. I don't think we have a choice. We need to step in. We need to make sure that there is restorative justice and equity so that Latinos who are the driving force of our economy are able to recover themselves. So our cities, economy, our state's economy, and this country's economy can recover. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We could make a whole show out of this, <laughs> you know, a whole hour. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, Dr. Alfredo Menalora, uh, Linda Tortolero, Alejandra Ibáñez, and Dr. Geraldine Luna. Thank you. Thank you.
We certainly learned the importance of health professionals over the course of the pandemic. And after years of preparation and long hours spent studying, students at Loyola University Chicago are on their way to becoming doctors. Chicago Tonight's Joanna Hernandez attends a special ceremony, ceremony called Match Day and tells us more. It's the final hurdle. Hundreds of medical students anxiously open their white envelopes. San Diego, we go to San Diego! Inside is the name of the institution where they will start the next chapter of their careers. It's just exciting. You see San Diego and four or five years of medical school. It's exciting and uh, exciting to be together at the same institution in California. It's called Match Day, where med students across the country match with the residency program to begin training in their specialties. David Mata is planning to pursue family medicine. I'm very passionate about uh, serving the underserved. I love everything, so working with kids, working with expecting mothers, so family medicine is the place to be. Mata is one of five students who studied at Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine as a DACA recipient. DACA is a policy where children of undocumented immigrants are temporarily protected from deportation. Professor Mark Koshevsky says 50 DACA students known as DREAMers have gone through the program since 2014. We do not have a physician workforce that has the diversity we need to properly serve the patient populations in the United States. And so when we heard about this qualified group of, of applicants who were bilingual, bicultural, had this resilience because they kept going when people told them that they couldn't do it, that they wouldn't be able to because they weren't citizens. That, that's the kind of thing that will make somebody a great doctor. It's a career-defining moment. Sambol Siddiqui is also a dreamer who matched with her first choice, the University of Chicago, to study family medicine. It's a full circle moment for the med student, whose family migrated to the U.S. from Pakistan when she was a little girl. It was hard for me to get health care from my parents. Ultimately, it started just with my own challenges. And then volunteering at free health clinics, I saw that there were other families like mine. Right? I wasn't the only one, and I thought, okay, you know what? Maybe through medicine, I can also you know, help my community. Siddiqui says she is determined to give back to those who've struggled like her family. The medical field can be often distrusting and people don't know if they can trust their doctors. And I think when you see people that look like you, you have an instant connection. Mata and Siddiqui are among 165 Loyola students on their next step to becoming doctors. Don't let anyone ever say no, that it's impossible, you can do it. Okay, find your people, they are there and they will help you and you will get there. Believe in your dreams. Now an American citizen, Mata hopes to one day help people along the border. What would you tell that kid from Mexico? Oh my God, I would tell him that you're gonna reach so many obstacles, so many challenges. You're gonna get knocked down so many times. You're gonna get back up and you're gonna do it. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Joanna Hernandez. Loyola University Chicago School of Medicine was actually the first medical school in the United States to accept DACA recipients. We're not done yet. If you weren't able to make it to the Cantini Park last summer to see the Creatures of the Dream World exhibition of Alebrijes, good news, 20 of those supersized sculptures have traveled to North Riverside Park Mall where you can actually see them before they move once more. Alebrijes are spread throughout the mall. They're on both the upper level and the lower level. Some are finished, some are in the process of being restored. They were outside at Cantini for six months. So the elements of nature took their toll. They were stored over the winter at the DuPage County Fairgrounds. So they got even more snow that way. And then they're going to permanent installations. So we partnered with the Mexican Cultural Center of DuPage and brought in 20 pieces here brought the artists back here to be able to allow people to see the restoration process, and it's been amazing. So the artists have come from Mexico, which is the greatest thing. So we get to kind of host the artists for a month at a time. A lot of people stop and they talk and they ask about the process and they ask about what he's doing. There are 12 million artists in Mexico who are doing this kind of art and who are unseen, unsung kind of heroes. To be able to host three of them here is a great thing to actually see the paper mache. So at Cantini, they were amazing and vibrant and beautiful. When you see them coming together 
it's kind of a different appreciation of the actual paper and paste. That education for people and just the awareness of a whole different kind of art is, is fascinating. Three Cartoneria artists will be in residence through April 19th, and the exhibition will be at North Riverside Park Mall through May 7th, actually. That's going to be our show for this weekend. If you're watching us on Saturday night, know that you can also catch Latino Voices and Black Voices on Sundays, beginning at 10 p.m. Don't forget also to tune in to Noticias Univision Chicago every weekday morning. I'll be waiting for you at 5 to 6. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Alex Hernandez. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Buenas noches. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.